Who doesn't want to fall in love, have children, save the planet, and be happy? Well, my guest today can show you how to do it all. Coming up next. Los Angeles. This is the special report with Ariva Martin. Today is all about being happy, and Frank Schaefer, a New York Times bestselling author, is here to show us how to do it. Frank is the author of more than a dozen fiction and nonfiction books. He's a survivor of both polio and an evangelical fundamentalist childhood. He's an acclaimed writer who overcame severe dyslexia, a homeschool and self-taught documentary movie director, and a feature film director of four, as he calls it, low-budget Hollywood features that he describes as, quote, pretty terrible, quote. <laughs> He's also an artist with a loyal following of collectors who own many of his oil paintings. He has spoken at dozens of major universities, libraries, museums, from the Hammer in LA to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. Frank's three semi-autographical novels about growing up in a fundamentalist mission, Portofino, Zermatt, and Saving Grandma, have been translated into nine languages. His video blogs posted on Facebook have millions of views. And his new book is Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. And I'm so excited to be sitting down and talking with Frank Schaefer this morning. Good morning and welcome back to the special report, Frank. Thank you so much for having me back. And thank you for that lovely introduction as well. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, that's like one tenth of all the stuff that I read that you've done in your incredible life. I had to figure out how to condense it in a way because I'd have been spending the whole time reading your intro rather than talking with you. And of course, I wanted to talk with you, but you have had Boy, what an amazing life. So let's talk about those oil paintings, first of all, because uh, we're looking at some of them. Tell us what, what, what's behind you in addition to that cover for your new book, but it looks like some beautiful artwork. Yeah, we, that's part of a series I did um, a little after Trump was elected, and I had a lot of Pinocchios falling out of the sky, but uh, because I also think that the intrinsic worth of beauty is something beyond question, even when you're doing a slightly satirical painting of a bunch of Pinocchios sim symbolizing the, the kind of rightward tilt and, and the lies that we're consumed by right now. Um, I work very hard on these. these. These paintings are very textured and the cyclamens fall down with, with the Pinocchios. And I have other ones with have teddy bears from my childhood. And the Pinocchios are ones my dad and mom gave me when I was six, seven years old. So there's a lot of nostalgia in those paintings as well as a little bit of commentary. So, uh, Frank, you've done so many things. You're a writer. You, you are a painter, obviously. You're a political commentator. You, you are, uh, I don't know, an abortion uh, activist or pro, I guess, choice activist. But uh, let's talk about your writing career. Because you've written a, a number of best-selling books, both fiction and nonfiction. Mm. Uh, what inspires you to write? Well, I kind of backed into that profession, and really, I have to thank my wife, Jeannie, who I've been with now for 52 years. We have three grown children, five grandchildren. You were talking about how indifferent and pretty terrible those movies were, in my own words, that I was making in Hollywood, and I was getting very frustrated with her as a husband, because unfortunately, back in those days, having been raised in evangelical circles, um, I had been given this insane theology that men are supposed to be in charge of everything, kind of a domineering male figure, you know, raised by divine right to be a sort of a jerk, really, in my early married years uh, as a husband. And Jeannie has always been one to try to work with me as I am. And, and through her example, I learned to really change for her. And one of the changes was to not keep banging my head into the wall of the film business, making second-rate scripts, exploitation pictures, horror movies, and so forth, when really I had better stories to tell. So Jeannie encouraged me, and she said, why don't you write a script um, that is similar to the stories you tell our kids around the kitchen table about growing up in the crazy evangelical mission you lived in and the way that your parents would go on vacation to Italy because they were in Switzerland, the mission was there, 
why don't you write something on that? And in fact, that turned into my first novel, Portofino. And uh, I know you guys are out of LA. It was actually the LA Times that gave me a big break because they did a full half page, six columns across the page. Wow. Uh, glowing review of the book, Richard Eater, who had been the, the chief of the book division at the New York Times, wrote it. And after that, you know, I had found what I was going to do. So I wrote the book in 1989. It was published in 1990, and that's a dozen or more books ago. And I was fortunate. But had it not been for Jeannie's good word saying, look, you know, you're a good storyteller. Why don't you go for it instead of doing all these second rate scripts? I never would have done it. So, like everything else in my life, essentially, with Jeannie out of the picture, my life is a ruin. With Jeannie in the picture, things uh, work well. And so she essentially started my writing career and has supported it ever since and been so kind with the way she has always pushed me to do something that is really better for both of us because uh, Jeannie realizes that, you know, when, when you make your partner happy, your spouse happy, you're happy. And so, you know, in a way, her altruism and unselfishness is what my whole book career is built on. Well, kudos to Jeannie, one, you know, and, and I'm not really all that surprised because it's always the woman that has the brilliant yep. idea. <laughs> so, so Jeannie's like so many other, you know, millions of American women who are the, the silent oftentimes partner pushing, yep. you know, the person that their, their spouse or partner. Uh, but I'm just glad that she had the vision and that you were receptive to her encouragement to uh, write these books, because obviously you, you've blessed a lot of people with these stories that you tell. Uh, so uh, let's talk about surviving polio. That's something that we don't hear a whole lot about, Frank, you know, in the 21st century. But uh, at some point, polio was a pretty serious disease. So you're a miracle of sorts that you're still with us. Yeah, well, I'm turning 70 um, next summer. And Jeannie just turned 70, by the way. We're, we're getting up there a little bit less ahead than behind us. But when I was two, uh, which would have been 1954, I got polio. And that was the year a lot of people were getting vaccinated. And by the way, when I look at all the vaccine resistance coming from the right wing and parroted by Fox News and all the rest of it, it infuriates me because I've got a withered, atrophied left leg and a foot that looks like a, a little child's foot that never grew. I'm lucky I can walk. Um, everything turned out fine, but it's given me a lifelong horror of anti-science or, or vaccine hesitancy. And so, you know, when I think about the climate we live in now, um, where we take for granted that we don't get smallpox, we don't get polio, we don't get these things because previous generations were smart enough to take advantage of a vaccine and not politicize it, I get a little bit annoyed. But I'm, I'm so grateful that my grandchildren and my children, for that matter, don't face the things that back in the 1950s we still yeah. faced, you know, diphtheria, polio, uh, smallpox was all over the world still. It hadn't been completely eradicated yet. So I, I am deeply, deeply grateful for uh, the science of vaccine and everything that goes into it. And I have a, a very bad leg, to put it that way, to show uh, what the alternative is to 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 going to the vaccine route for little children and vaccine hesitancy. My parents were not anti-vax. They didn't make a decision not to get me vaccinated. They just got on a boat called the Ile de France, sailed to Europe. And by the time we got there, after a visit home that they had made to, to their parents from the mission in Switzerland that they were running, um, I was running a high fever and got really sick. And, and the fact that I didn't die was really fortunate. Yeah. Well, we're glad that you did because you had obviously lots of living to do and, and lots to share with so many people. So let's talk about this book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. So it, it's like everything all of us aspire to do in one book title. Uh, was there any resistance from publishers? You know, publishers typically like short titles. They like things yeah. in hashtag. You know, they want it to be quick and memorable. So when you said, look, I, I got like, you know, 15, 20 words I want to put in this title. What did your publisher say? Well, fortunately, Christine Belaris, my editor at HCI Books, was uh, loved the title, and it drew her in immediately, counterintuitively, exactly because of what you're saying. In other words, if you're going to break the rules, really break them. Uh, so, you know, let's, uh, if you're going to go for a long title, let's go for a ridiculously long title and make the cover of the book almost an apology for the whole book and, and pull people in by them saying, how can this be? You know, what does all this mean? What's he mean by these things? So, so far, people have 
um, responded well. And, and fortunately, the rest of her company did as well. So, you know, it, it wasn't a tough sell because Christine loved it. In fact, I had a couple alternatives and backups for her thinking that that would be the reaction. And because she went for that one, um, it made everything very easy because then she sat down with their designer and said, let's really make those words on the cover pop. And as you can see from the cover, they turned it into a graphic that uses the words in an artistic kind of almost bullet pointed way. Yeah, no, I did a great job. Cover is fabulous. So I've written uh, four books, uh, working on my fifth Frank. So I know something about this process of writing. But tell us what, what inspired, usually, you know, I, I'm inspired by something, uh, each of the four books I've written. W what inspired this? Fall in love, have children. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, in so many ways, I think it's what we're all thinking about at any given point in our lives, maybe not in that order, and maybe we can add or, you know, take away from your title, but, but what inspired you to write this book at, at this moment? Well, there, there have been two books in my life that really came um, from my heart in a very direct way before I even knew they would be books. One was called Keeping Faith, a Father-Son Story About Love in the United States Marine Corps. Obvious title. Uh, my son joined the Marines when he was 18, right out of high school, and this was just before 9-11. So as he completed his basic training, the planes flew into the towers. And of course, what he had done is a kind of a high school lark, saying, well, I need a little more discipline. I don't want to go to college right away like my brother who's at Georgetown or my sister who went to NYU. I want to do something a little different, um, turned into a very serious proposition. and. That book became something that was kind of wrenched from me as someone who had been dubious about his decision, but then really where I found a new respect for him and how that changed his life. And now that's not a commentary on joining the military, let alone George Bush's wars, which I did not approve of. But uh, it was started with an exchange of letters with, with John from boot camp. This book came from a similar experience that really was was, was direct from the heart, uh, not in any way outlined or calculated. And that was that I started keeping a diary 13 years ago when, my, when the first of my three youngest grandchildren, Lucy, who's now 13, was born. Now, I have two older grandchildren who belong to my daughter, Jessica. Do the math. I got Jeannie pregnant when we were 17 and 18. Jessica had her babies in, in her mid-20s. And so I have two older grandchildren who are the age of my friends' kids because they, they all did the, 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 the more modern today's kind of way of doing things. You wait till you're 30 and then you get married, maybe have a baby and five years later decide to, you know, whatever it is, have IVF or something to help you along because you've waited and the fertility curve. Well, she kind of followed me. So I have two older grandchildren who grew up in Europe. But when my son, John, the Marine, came back from war, he went to the University of Chicago. Did very well. Great and school. I went there. That's a great school. Well, there you are. So, and, he, and, and before he graduated, he married Becky, a girl he had known in high school. They hadn't been an item then, but they got back together. And she was someone who wanted to have her children young uh, and not wait forever. And by the way, Becky has a brilliant career now, and he does too. And so it wasn't a question of choosing one or the other, which is a big point that I try to make in the book. So... Becky and John moved in with Jeannie and me for two years while they got their financial act together after college, and during that time had Lucy. Well, Lucy just absolutely changed my life because when I had been parenting, I was b busy striving out on the road, spending too much time away. There were years when I was away six, seven months of the year, which is one of the reasons I, I talk about in the book how uh, I, I you know, look back with some regret now in terms of how bad some of my parenting was, how absent it was. But here I had a, another bite at the apple. I had a chance to, to, to reparent myself with this little girl. And so right here in this studio, I would march around and she would sleep in my arms. By the way, if a child holds one position in your arm for an hour and a half nap every day, you can get tennis elbow, which, I, <laughs> which is an interesting little footnote. So I'd play her music and we'd sleep in here and you want to get in good with a young parent. Just be the person who can make their children nap. So that was me. <laughs> and what started out as a kind of I'll help around a little bit and do some child care became a full-time vocation. So I found myself, surprising for me, turning down speaking invitations, which I needed because I support my career as a writer by going out and letting people know about my books. Yes. This is, of course, pre-COVID. 
And um, I would turn them down because you know what I was saying to myself? Yeah, but if I go away for a week and I'm in uh, wherever, you know, California or Iowa or somewhere on this book tour thing, I'm going to miss yeah. uh, Lucy. I'm not going to see her. So what turned into help out a couple young parents while they got on their feet became a new vocation for me, which was real full-time super nanny grandpa stay-at-home child care. And when Nora uh, and Jack, well, Jack and then Nora came along, by that time, um, I was the daycare center. Wow. And Jeannie was helping out, but she had kind of been there, done that with my kids. So it, it fell more to me than to her in the final analysis in terms of hours oh, yeah, per day. You hit on so many important points. And I know this book isn't just for men or just for women, it's for everyone. But I'm sitting here thinking about this message, this, 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 you as a dad acknowledging that you weren't around as much as you, you know, should have been for your own kids. Now yeah. getting this second chance with your grandkids and, yeah. and not letting that get by again, by, like you said, getting on the road. Uh, what was the response from your, your alpha male friends? I assume, you know, given how you grew up, you have a lot of alpha male friends, or at least you did. Yes. What, what were they thinking as you're saying, I'm not taking that job. I'm not taking this job. I, I'm here for Lucy. Well, the first thing is, is, you know, having written a, a book that was a bestseller with the Marine Corps family, amongst other people, I mean, literally any recruiting station you walk into, you'll find Keeping Faith on the shelf, because it's a book they use to explain to other parents how even people who are not military people in the end can come to respect service, irrespective of their politics. So that said, um, you know, I, I'm not the kind of person that would be expected to write a, a mushy Hallmark greeting card uh, book on childcare. But really, the thesis of my book is this. Look, I spent the first half of my life throwing away the candy and eating the wrapper. That's it. And I, uh, I, I kind of missed the point. I didn't understand that we humans, which I go to, into in the book, uh, that there's a science, especially it's about 25, 30 years old, very in-depth now studying bonding processes with males and not just females. We also evolved as nurturing caregivers. And one of the reasons we have so much unhappiness in our culture, so much loneliness, so much male suicide, so much despondency, and, and so much family breakup is that we have designed a culture, not intentionally, but we have designed a culture in which shareholder profits trump human happiness. And so essentially, there are men who want to take time off with their kids, and it took COVID to get them home to let them see what that extra time would be. Now that's that's kind of a thread in my book, but right, that's not where I start. That's not where I started. I started with with the experience of childcare and the diary I was keeping, and then after that, began to really investigate what I thought was going to be a, a year and a half Hold writing a process. Hold on a second. I, I want to know though. I'm, I'm trying to find out what is it. What was the response? Because Lucy comes along 13 years ago, way before the book. Sure. And as you're starting to be this this you know, caregiver, this number one yeah. caregiver for your granddaughter, what are these guys that, you know, the, the men in your life, because men don't typically do that. This is- Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll give you a typical example. I have a friend in your neck of the woods who's a, a leading uh, Hollywood entertainment attorney who I'd worked with back in the bad old days of the film business. And I talked to him one time and made an inadvertent slip of the tongue, which was very self-revealing, but he kind of cottoned onto in a weird way. And that is, he was saying to me, well, what are you writing? And I said, well, right now I'm not writing anything. This is, you know, remember that this, this, this book took six years, but those first six years with Lucy, I wasn't writing. I was keeping some notes about taking care of her. And I said, oh, I'm not writing anything right now. And he says, well, when, what are you doing? And I, I said, I'm doing full-time childcare. So there was this long pause and he said, well, you know, um, can't they get a babysitter? Can't they get a nanny? And I said, well, why would they do that? And I said, furthermore, you know, I have much more in common with the young parents and the moms who are doing school pickups. This is when I, this, when Lucy was a little older uh, than I do with guys like you now. And so he said, what are you talking about? And I said, look, you know, I, I happen to enjoy the school pickups because it gives me a chance to hang around with, and then this was my slip of the tongue, the other young mothers. And he, there was this long pause and he says, God damn it, Frank. You know, what are you talking about? You, you know, you're 65 years old. You just called yourself a young mother. What, what's going on here? And he was laughing. It was all very good humor. Right. 
it was a real disconnect. And it, and, and, and it really made me think, um, and I put something about this in the book, and that is it, it really all goes back not to male and female or, or, or non-binary or trans. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It has to do with our definition of success. So if your definition of success is the size of your paycheck and even more the prestige of the position you hold, so you really would feel better about saying, I'm a vice president of a company than saying, I'm in charge of the cleanup crew um, in, in you know, the janitorial thing. That matters. You know, def defining ourselves by job title and income. Mm -hmm. if, if, on the other hand, you begin to define yourself by what you see, and I, I'm not trying to be maudlin and touchy-feely here, I really mean this, but what you see reflected back in the eyes of the people who love you and know you best, and when I was a father raised in this harsh evangelical tradition, what I often saw reflected back after screaming at the children and threatening and being and throwing my weight around and telling them to obey me, come what may, and so forth and so on, was fear. Mm -hmm. And what I see reflected back from Jack and Lucy and Nora is unconditional love and trust. Do you see completely from? different things? And it isn't because I have gone from being some sort of a monster to an enlightened person. You know, what the story I tell in Fall in Love, Have Children Stay Put, Save the Planet. Well, let, me happy. This, let me ask you this. Do you see this notion that you said what you saw in kids that grew up with you was, was fear? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a mistake that a lot of uh, fathers make is that they discipline their kids, you know, to they train their yes, kids? Yes, I do. I think it is a mistake and you regret it later. But the fact is, it's, it's, it, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not pushing the blame off the individual, but if you are chasing an idea of success in which everything that gets in the way of the striving part of your life is an annoyance to be gotten through, uh, you know, that late night feeding, that diaper change, the child waking you again, the need to, 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 to take care, the, the kid that comes in and interrupts when you're having sex, the knock on the door, the inconvenience. If, if you look at all this as interrupting a kind of a quest, for a certain level of success, then everything becomes an annoyance. But if you flip it and you're saying, look, this is gonna go by very quickly. And I have a very limited amount of time to experience the, the joy. I didn't say it was easy and you're happy all the time, but the joy <clears throat> of a profound human connection with my child, be that an adoptive child to a gay couple or a, a biological child to a parent. It changes everything. Now, it doesn't mean it's all easy. But it means that your priorities now have shifted and you are looking for the human experience above the commercial consumerist business experience. When you start doing that, um, you begin to really treasure and I guess find an inner stillness that allows you to really see what's in front of you. And what's in front of you is a gem of a human being developing in the shadow of your care and your love and, and protection and kindness. And sure, there has to be discipline and sure there has to be boundaries, but it's a very different thing than that kind of flipping an, out an annoyance because the kid is in the way. And, and when you start asking yourself, what are they in the way of? And if it all boils back down to career and position and striving and positioning and quote unquote grown up things, which actually turn out to be very childish things that we should all get past at some point, you know, when, when, you, when you redefine what success is to you, as I talk about in the book, you have a completely different attitude. Now, that doesn't mean you work it all out and solve all your problems, but it's a better starting position. Yeah. Uh, so many people parent the way that they were parented. And so if their parents yelled at them, yeah. they yell at their kids. Uh, if their parents were, you know, abusive to them, they then repeat that behavior. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? you know, it's going to take for some parents or how do you get parents to break those cycles that, uh, you know, that, that may have been negative in, in the way that they were parenting to parent yeah. what I'll call this more, or what you perceive, perceive to be this more enlightened way. How do well, you- Well, one thing to do is do what I do with Nora, who's seven and, 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 and it's different than I told my own kids. And that is, I tell the truth to her about myself. I, and yesterday, for instance, I picked her right up at school. We had an unusually warm day for here. It was in the mid fifties, which is crazy for this close to Christmas. So I decided to take her straight to the beach from school and, and get a snack along the way. And I had been kind of tightly wound doing all kinds of stuff. And 
And after a couple minutes, you know, I'd given her some very short responses. I said to her, is Ba, she calls me Ba, B-A, is Ba being really grumpy today? And she says, yes, you're being terrible. And I said, well, what, do we, what can we do about this? Are you hungry? Are you in a bad mood too? Or is it just me? Now, see, as soon as that happens, as soon as you admit that A, you're fallible, and B, that you know you're being grumpy. And then a few minutes later, I was still kind of not, not in a good frame. And I said, am I yelling? Am I yelling at you? Have I been yelling at you? Or are we having a nice conversation? And she says, you have been yelling. And I said, on a scale of one to 10, where you know, 10 is pure evil, and it's, it's Germany invading Europe, and one is the nicest person you ever met. Where have I been on the scale so far in this car ride? And she says, I don't think, I think you've been a seven. And I said, that bad? And we joked about it. See, now that's the deal. I haven't made myself into a, 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 an altogether better person, but I am honest with her that I have feet of clay, that I'm not, not only am I not perfect, but she gets to call me on it. And so she has this little thing she does. She makes a letter C, which for her represents, because I explained to her sometimes I have too much coffee. I say sitting here sipping coffee. And she says to me, over-caffeinated. It's her little sign. So if I get grumpy and she goes like this, we laugh about it. That's a totally different rep relationship. And we have, you know, and, and, and that may be a small example, but that's the difference between a guy pushing 70 and a young parent who feels they got to rule everything around them or somehow feel insecure about it. Yeah, what about those parents, Frank, though, feel like that they've got to be tough, particularly on their, their sons? You know, that we have this kind of concept yeah. in this country that guys got to grow up tough. And the dad's job is to teach a boy how to be a man. Uh, what would you say to those dads who have bought into that? Because that's the way they've been raised. I would say been there, done that. And if you read um, the book, you will find that it's not a book claiming that I have found some perfect way to be. It's rather a journey from somebody who was raised, and if I may use this language, I'm sorry, to be an asshole by divine right because God had put you in charge of women, God had put you in charge of children, you had to have this role, to someone who really looks back now on <clears throat> my marriage and, and fatherhood and the child, children I'm taking care of as a grandfather and understand there was a completely different thread running through my life that now is, is, the, is the thing I value most. And the shame is, is to look back and realize there were huge periods of your life when what you were doing and you put the most weight on and you thought were most important were actually a very minor note. Uh, the big note was what is the quality of your interpersonal relationships? And this has nothing to do with trying to live a better life or a moral call or what's right or wrong. It's kind of altruistic selfishness, if I can put it that way. If you want to find joy and be happy, your interpersonal human relationships have got to work. That's where lives fall apart. <clears throat> jobs are replaceable. There's no such thing as a career. It's only a job, okay? I don't diss careers. I do full-time childcare so my, my daughter-in-law can have a wonderful career, and she does. My daughter is, my daughter Jessica, the one who's 50, is a CEO of a company in New York, and she had her kids quite young like I did, and then she went back to school. She was living in Europe in Finland, finished her degree that she had interrupted from NYU, then went into business. And if younger people in her company ask her how, how, what she has done and how it all worked, I talk about her in the book. She gives the example saying, look, this may not be cool in the world of business we're operating in. And she's in New York, as I say, um, with an office in Manhattan. But I learned 10 times more from being a parent and from being a mom than I've ever learned about business from any other source. And they kind of, their jaws drop because women like men think you've got to choose between your business life and so on. I, you know, I talk about women in the book who, who go so far as to not admit they're on the way to a school pickup or maybe to take care of an old parent. Because it's, you know, if you're working for Goldman Sachs, they don't want to hear about caregiving. They just want to hear about how much money you're making. So I, I think one of the threads in my book is that since COVID, we now have an opportunity to step back and say, look, it's like Frank was writing this book saying, take a deep breath, think about the direction of your life. And the COVID pandemic has forced us globally to do that. Now, that doesn't mean all the results are good. I have friends who've died, but it does mean that a lot of people who never thought they would have time to think about these things were forced to. For instance, my daughter, again, talking about the difference with a, 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 a president of a bank she works with regularly in, in investment strategies. She said after COVID hit and he's working from home, one day he's sitting there on a Zoom call saying, shh, be quiet. I have to talk quietly. I just put my daughter down for a nap. She says, I didn't even know this guy had kids. He never talked about it. 
So these, these days, when we talk about things like paid parental leave and so forth, there's a lot more pressure on the government. There's a lot more pressure on social institutions because people for a minute, for a year or less, got a little taste of what it would be like if you weren't living in a world where everything is go, go, go all the time. And a lot of them are quitting their jobs, renegotiating exactly because of the pressures I talk about in the book. So in a way, you know, the, the first thread of the book was the grandchildren. The second thread was the science that's amazing, by the way, in terms of neurobiology and evolutionary science that backs up the contention that it's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. It's all about relationships, period. End of story. That's it. That's our whole life. Everything else is either BS or to make money for people. And yes, we all need jobs. And yes, I believe in vocations. And yes, there are people like you, um, Ariva, who do wonderful things that it's a vocational calling. But at the end of the day, your career is not going to hold your hand on your deathbed. That's yeah, the, I, that's I the bottom line. Saying, uh, Frank, when I'm sitting here thinking about the young couples that don't have the advantage like your son and daughter-in-law have of having parents like sure. you and Jeannie, uh, who are really struggling to make ends meet and they have to work two and three jobs and be yes. from their kids in order to even pay their rent and you know put food on the table what do you have to say for the what what advice can you give to someone who's in that situation because i, I don't want the message to be and i, I i'm sure, sure that's not what you're intending it to be is that everyone despite their income level, you know, can just put jobs aside and focus on their kids and family, because we know in, in this country, making a living is a, 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 a imperative for people. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you and achieve that work-life balance if you are a low-income wage earner, or if you are, you know, in middle management, and the only sure. way you can support your family is by working 12 or 14 hours. Been there, done that. And, you know, my uh, writer's life is not one of huge income surges that pay all the bills forever. You know, if you want to choose that path, you, you don't write and paint, uh, you do something else. And, you know, watching how Jeannie supplemented our income for many years, went to the Boston School of Fashion Design, did everything from curtains to wedding dresses for people, ran a mail order company out of a little barn garage I had for a while. You know, th th this is not a billionaire talking to you here. This is a guy who's been a a uh, freelance artist and writer with a wife who's done the same kind of work. That said, yes, jobs have to be real and all the rest of it. When we set our priorities differently than what the culture is telling us to, then maybe we vote for people who don't screw up Biden's initiative for paid family leave and reduce it to a pitiable four weeks when it should be at least a year with a full government subsidy on the par with Social Security at least plus a kind of a Medicare arrangement for your children and you and your family. You know, we have the money to spend on multi-trillion dollar foreign wars that we've lost, by the way, all of them, since North Korea uh, drew the line there at the, D the DMZ. It hasn't gone so great. We've spent trillions and we've gotten nothing for it. And yet a mom working three jobs who has a child has to go back to work within two or three days, still bleeding. And if she had a C-section, doubled over because she can't stand upright, and we're doing nothing about it. So my book is not a call for vast government intervention to change America into some socialist super state and, and, and the likes. It is simply a call for the basic humanity to organize our society around the actual needs of people. They need real choices. And that means single mothers get full support. That means we have paid parental leave for at least a year when any child is born. Parental, I didn't say for mothers, I mean everybody. That means that uh, arrangements are made so that we get more intergenerational connection between grandparents and children. That means caregiving at the other end of life. If you're a 60 year old and you're caring for your mother with Alzheimer's, you get bailed out. We have the money as a culture, we have this, the, the will when it comes to ordinary people, but we also have a system which gives big tax cuts to billionaires and doesn't take care of other people. So. My book is basically laying out an agenda, which is legislative and political. But in the meantime, I'm telling people, until we work to make these things happen, we have to do our best as individuals to support one another. So when I talk about fall in love, I mean fall in love with love itself, as well as romantic love, which I found in my life. But I also mean fall in love as a priority, and that is the giving and receiving of caregiving. Right now, for instance, Ariva, you are my caregiver. 
you're, you're, you are loco parentis for me. You are my mom right now. You're doing what parents do. And that is your child. That's me. You've taken me under your wing right now, has written a book. And through you, through your kindness, are taking a magnet and putting my little drawing up on your refrigerator so that it gets noticed. This is caregiving. And, and so when we talk about have children, we're talking about a caregiving attitude to those around us. When we talk about stay put, it means not chasing only after money and position, but knowing who your neighbors are, trying to stay grounded in your community. So I am not talking about a perfect alternative to having to earn your living as if there's some magical solution. I'm right. saying when we reorganize our priorities around caregiving and love, we see the world differently. We see those around us differently. Maybe we get no more time with our family than we had before, but we make sure it's better spent. Less looking at screens, more, more tactile relationship to the world, more putting away your work at the end of the day and, and giving your undivided attention for the time you have to that child and seeing the preciousness of it. And, and so I don't think that the book in a way sets out a, an alternative as in, hey, look at me, this is the better way. It's the opposite. It's look, I screwed up. Here's how to make less mistakes than I did. I'm passing this back to you along the trail here. I'm leaving some markers for you because I'm getting older now. My time's going to run out, and I wish I had heard about this in, before. And then the last thing is the book sets out some priorities for government. There is a real legislative agenda here. We've got to start electing people who care about human values more than they care about the bottom line on business. And these are not mutually exclusive, because the irony is actually, like you talk about the great resignation, people leaving work right now, right. any company that stepped forward and said, guess what, Amazon is going to have a full bore nursery school system as part of every single warehouse that packs stuff. From now on, all parents with kids who are preschool are going to have a Montessori run, beautifully designed, hands-on, lots of mud and sand and wood and sticks and creativity, not a bunch of screens. We're going to have professional. That's part of the deal. We're not only going to, to encourage people to have full lives, we are going to back you because we have the money to do it. Smaller companies would be able to look to some government assistance for that. We don't even think of these things right. because in the U.S., basically, we only have one message for a young parent. You are on your own. And I am saying it is time to fall in love with love. All of us have children. That includes my son, Francis, who is single and, and pushing his 50s and is not going to pair bond and is not going to have kids. But he's a teacher. And I have parents come up to me and tell me what he's meant to their kids and how he's turned their lives around. So, you know, I don't think this book presents people with a choice of sort of do it my way or no way. I'm saying rather, reconsider your priorities, order them around what is best for the people around you to whom you are giving care. You need to receive care too. So you better cultivate those friendships and family because you're not alone, but our culture pretends we are. It pretends we're all individualists. Actually, we're not. If you study evolution, we evolved for one principle and one principle only. It was not the survival of the fittest. That's the old science. All the new science points in a different direction. It's the survival of the friendliest. Mm -hmm. it's the, it is the ability to cooperate. That's why we survive. Reva, you and me are only here talking today because somewhere in our ancestry, before we all walked out of Africa together and dispersed across the world, there are caregivers in your history there was a child somewhere left by a path because somebody was killed or died of illness that was picked up and carried forward by the community and cared for. That's why we're all here. We all have that in our history. And without the history of caregiving, without the history of empathy, none of us are here. We're not having this discussion, which is one reason I'm an optimist about our human future, because it is caregiving that has been given a short shrift these days. But the fact is, everybody longs for it. And the kind of decisions we've made since COVID point out that people want to work from home if they can. People do want more time with their families. Younger people would like to fall in love and have options if they have a child. Lots of older women I know who are friends of mine, I don't know her, but including Michelle Obama, who has said this frequently in talks she gives, basically looks back and said, you know, that big fancy career I had, I wound up ignoring my, my biological fertility clock. And we had to use IVF finally to have children. And she was in the medical business and she talks to younger women about this. So I think we're getting to a point where we're saying, look, there's something weird about the fact that we have a near trillion dollar fertility industry 
geared to women and to couples who wait a long time because their the corporate structure in America really doesn't want you to have families. That's why they think women are dangerous because they do this crazy thing called having babies. And so they minimize them. Instead of flipping the whole thing and saying, we should be supportive of the human adventure before the business adventure. That's all I'm saying. That's what the book is about. It's redefining success. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's for a mom working three jobs like a friend of mine up at Lowe's who does the, the checkout on the hardware part, the back of the store, and then crosses the street and works at Kohl's in the night because they're paying her $34 an hour, unbelievably, because it's, it's overtime for Christmas. I know her. I talk to her. I do a lot of building. I enjoy maintenance around my property. I ask her how she's doing. She tells me the jobs she's working. It's phenomenal. I honor that. And all I'm saying is we ought to live in a culture that looks at someone like that and asks one question how can I help you? And we don't live in that culture. We live in a culture that says, what can I get out of you? Yeah. Got to leave it there, Frank. Thank you so much. Thank you for your insights. Uh, great. Make sure you pick up this book, perfect for the holidays, perfect for going into the new year. Uh, as you think about your priorities, uh, fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet, be happy. Frank Schaefer, pleasure speaking with you this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to Frank and thanks to all of you for joining me this morning. We're talking about being happy. You got to make sure you pick up Frank's book. It's fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet and be happy. Uh, Frank has had an interesting journey. His, his life is, is quite fascinating. So this is just one of many of his books. So when you go to the store, when you go to Amazon, probably, which is where most of you will go to pick up his book, you'll find so many of the other uh, books, uh, you know, incredible books that he's written. Uh, make sure you check them out, uh, figure out how you are going to stay put and save the planet and be happy in the new year. Uh, some words to live by before I get out. And I think they're the words from Frank, be happy. Such a simple but profound statement. And at the end of the day, I think I agree with Frank. We all just want to be happy, whatever that means for us. Obviously, it means something different for all of us, uh, but I'm hoping that we can all find how to be happy. I'm out, y'all be safe out there. Don't forget to wear your mask. Don't forget to get your booster shot. And remember, we're all in this together.